I'm joined today for part three of this series on prolegomena in Mark's gospel, preliminary issues. I'm joined by um, Josh Pelletier, a former student of mine. He did a master's thesis that I supervised. Uh, I think he finished it uh, a little over a year ago or about a year ago. Maybe it was, I don't know. I forgot when you finished it, Joshua. But um, anyway, just uh, you did some fantastic work and I really think uh, people can find uh, your research and what you found quite interesting. So um, let's just recap what we discussed in our first two videos. Again, this is our third and final one of it. But the first one, we talked about the dating of Mark. When was Mark, the Gospel of Mark, composed? Tell us a little, just summarize your findings on that. It's essentially the majority of scholars believe, about uh, 98 scholars believe, that uh, the dating was 70 or earlier for the Gospel of Mark. Okay, and that came, what was the percentage of that? Out of the scholars. 61%. You, yeah, if, if, if we sample it based upon scholarly opinions, personal opinions, it's a little over uh, 61%, yes. Yeah, fantastic. So they're saying that it was written before 70. Yes. And then you said, if we fine tune that even further, it's in the 60s and probably uh, the most within that category would be 65 to 70. Yes. Okay. And then in our second video, uh, we talked about the authorship of Mark. And what did we find? Well, I don't remember the numbers, but uh, the majority of scholars hold to the traditional uh, view that Mark and or John Mark wrote the gospel. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, the traditional authorship, majority of scholars do, uh, uh, critical scholars since 1965, writing in English, your, your sampling included 207, correct? Yes. That's, that's a pretty robust sampling. All right, and you're saying the conclusion is the majority of critical scholars since 1965 um, think that the traditional authorship of Mark is correct. Yes. Okay. So now we come to our third and final topic, and that is whether there was a Petrine connection um, involved. Did the author of Mark's gospel get his information or at least most of the information from Peter? Or, yes. <laughs> or some of the information, whatever. So we want to know, Peter's involvement. Was Peter involved in this gospel? Uh, yeah. Does this information typically go back to Peter? So Mark, where, where do scholars think, Josh, where do, uh, about Mark? Was he an eyewitness of Jesus? Um, yeah. What do they, what do they think? Um, the majority who answer that question or write on that question uh, don't think Mark was an eyewitness. They think that. Uh, they, 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 they hold to more of what the tradition says where Mark wrote down Peter's sayings and there's debate about whether or not he was interpreter or translator, but at the end of the day, he was, Peter was associated with the gospel in some form. Gotcha. All right. So why is the connection between Mark and Peter important? Well, um, the consequence of Peter being Mark's source is, as William Barclay stays, states, Mark's is the nearest approach we will ever possess to an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. If Mark is the earliest gospel and Peter is behind that source, Peter being a close disciple of Christ, we have a very beautiful book in front of us. Um, yeah. You're going to say yeah, well, I was thinking, okay, so if Barclay is saying that about Peter, so close as we get to an eyewitness, of course, then he's rejecting the traditional authorship of Matthew and John. Oh, well, okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe he thinks that uh, Peter was closer than those two. I, I have no idea. Okay. All right. So what are some of the internal arguments that Petrine tradition is behind the Gospel of Mark? Well, f remarkably, the internal arguments for Petrine tradition is quite strong, and there's a lot of them, uh, a lot more than I thought there were going to be. Uh, first of all, 
by internal, we're talking primarily about the the Bible itself, and it's going to be the New Testament. So it could be uh, the Gospel of Mark or any of the other books in that in that tradition. So the First Peter five thirteen, Peter calls Mark his son, and Babylon is thought to be Rome. And so that right there is consistent with what the patristic data says, where uh, Mark wrote while he was in Rome, whether it's during Peter's life or after is subject to debate, but Peter was still um, responsible for that composition as far as speaking it. Uh, Walter A. Elwell and Robert W. Yarbrough, uh, they say the Jewishness of Mark reflects the writer and his source Peter rather than the place of origin itself. So where you see it being Jewish in nature, it actually reflects more of who Peter was or his connection than actually it being written uh, wherever wherever, they, wherever that origin would have been. Uh, Donald A. Hagner says, a considerable amount of attention given to Peter in Mark's gospel, the high frequency of references among the gospels. So He's just saying that Peter is mentioned quite a bit, or uh, there's a lot of attention given to Peter in Mark's gospel as compared to uh, the other gospels. And William G. Johnson elaborates on that a little bit. He says, where Peter enters Mark's narrative, the account becomes particularly particularly vivid. So he mentions Mark 136 and a whole bunch of other uh, verses where it's, it's extremely vivid. So it's almost like, you had to really know Peter personally in order to write about these things. Um, and then Mark sometimes mentions Peter by name in certain passages where the uh, double tradition pericopes uh, do not. Um, and then Mark also records that Peter remembered certain things. He writes it as Peter remembered, and that could be best explained as that information come from Peter himself, just like the church tradition also suggests. And then Mark also records... Uh, Peter's weaknesses and his sins. And uh, the Gospel of Mark has a sort of elaboration or generally outlines Peter's sermon in Caesarea in Acts chapter 10, 36 through 43. So you can see uh, Peter's sermon and how it, it's sort of out, it's outlined sort of in uh, Mark's Gospel. And that's what some scholars would say. Interesting. Okay. So that's the some of the internal evidence that Mark got his information from Peter, how would those who reject the Petrine connection, how would they respond? What are some of the arguments against uh, that? Well, there's really hmm. not uh, great arguments against the internal evidence. I mean, it's, it's, uh, they just say, well, uh, the, the gospel itself is not an eyewitness account. And they just kind of conjecture that. Um, R.C. Briggs, he says, it is illogical to suggest that the gospel preserve eyewitness or apostolic reports. No single person could have been eyewitness to all the events reported in the gospels, particularly in those circumstances where Jesus is explicitly said to have been alone. So he's attacking all the gospels, saying that they can't just be written by one author or one eyewitness. And that's, well, that's not very strong at all. No, <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't do that today of a biographer, right? Someone who well, sat down and did the biography of Steve Steve Jobs, you wouldn't fault him because the biographer wasn't an eyewitness to all the things that that Steve Jobs told him about. Yeah, that's that's the sort of stuff that uh, are arguments against the internal evidence. It's it's uh, they're not strong at all. It's mostly conjecture and weak stuff like that. We, we, most of them are that weak. Uh at least for internal, at least what I surveyed, yeah. Okay, wow. What are, So what are some of the external evidences of, for the Petrine connection? And I, I suppose that this will dovetail with some of the stuff we talked about in our previous segment about the traditional authorship of Mark. But just so we can recap some of that, maybe add some other stuff, um, especially for those who may not have seen that second one and we'll provide a link at the end of this to that second one. But um, yeah, so what would you say um, are, are some of the strong external evidences for a Petrine connection with Mark's gospel? Well, firstly, uh, this, this first one isn't an argument, but it's an important uh, comparison. Uh, James M. Dawsey says, 
what is so per- surprising once we begin to compare the method of biblical scholars with that of secular historians is that the quality of the early traditions connecting Peter to Mark's gospel compares favorably with what we know about Plato and other ancients. So we have – we know a lot more about what's behind um, – the gospel mark than we even do of Plato and other agents. Uh, and so like with the authorship, there's a consistent uh, patristic testimony, which places Peter as Mark's source. And that's really what the external evidence is. Wow. Yeah. Now I know that some will say that uh, the gospel authors do not really mention their sources, at least in a direct manner. Um, and although that is true, that is likewise true of, of most other ancient biographers and historians of that period. Sometimes they would mention them, but that's the exception rather than the norm. Um, in most cases, they wouldn't mention their sources. And sometimes they would do it in an indirect manner. So like, for example, I know in Plutarch's Life of Caesar, when they get to the Rubicon, um, he mentions Caesar's associates, among whom uh, it was uh, Asinius Pollio. And uh, Christopher Pelling and others suggest that he's mentioning that um, as, as a means to indirectly mention his source of the story, being Pollio. Um, so, yeah, you, you typically don't have a mentioning of the sources, at least in a direct manner, in ancient biography and and histories. Again, it does happen at times, but it's the exception rather than the rule. So the external evidences, I mean, you quoted that guy, but that, that would be people mentioning the association of uh, the ancient church fathers mentioning the association between Peter and, and Mark. And do you remember who some of those were? I mean, of course you got Papias. He's our earliest one. Uh, probably Irenaeus, yeah. right? Yeah, so you have Papias, Arnaeus, uh, I believe, uh, yes, I believe Clement. I don't Clement can't remember. Clement of Alexandria? I believe he did, yes. Uh, but just so I don't misquote anyone, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. And whoever writes on Peter's association with Mark, don't, pre- don't present anyone else. Okay. All right, so what about the... What are some other sources that scholars think Mark used? Um, well, let, let me ask you this. What are some of the arguments that they use ex, using external evidence against Petrine authorship? Right. So kind of like with the authorship, there's different sorts of arguments against the patristic testimony. That's where they have to go. Uh, and so they'll just simply try to show that the patristic testimony is untrustworthy um, another one that's important. And we looked at that because of their criticisms of Papias, right? And we addressed that in the previous. Yeah, okay. Papias, and they, they try to go after the other ones, but it's primarily Papias. Um, higher criticism, such as form criticism, challenges the external data. So for a long time, uh, it was believed that, uh, and it is believed today still, but that patristic testimony told us um, where Mark got his source, Peter. Form criticism, however, argues that uh, it's oral tradition, not so much Peter. And of course, there's some who hold to multiple ideas. They might say, well, Mark got his information from both oral tradition and, say, Peter. But some who hold to the form criticism will say, no, the, the, the patristics is incorrect. Okay. So, all right, that kind of dovetails a little bit on the next question as um – what other sources might Mark have used in addition to what he remembered Peter saying? Right. So those, there are people who believe that Peter as well as something else might have been Mark's source. And so that different things such as oral tradition, uh, whether that be maybe how we think of, uh, the, the teachings being taught and being written down, written, uh, traditions. There is units of tradition, such as miracles. Uh, these are independent. The passion narrative uh, is independent source. Uh, there is Matthew and Luke was Mark's source for some people, um, or just Matthew himself. Uh, there is 
his mother's female friends are thought to maybe be his source, particularly where Mark writes about them. They think that uh, some scholars think that maybe those ladies told them told him about that event, so he wrote down. The disciples themselves, Jesus, the apostolic church, Paul could have been a source. Uh, the church or Christian community in the Old Testament, the Septuagint was a source for Mark that he drew off of, as well as himself. Perhaps he edited things and, and put his own opinion there. There's some, some of the uh, sources that scholars think. Wow. Now, several years ago, a New Testament scholar named Dennis McDonald posited that uh, Mark um, just made up a bunch of stuff, invented a bunch of stuff, and he patterned it after the Homeric epics. Has, uh, have you seen many scholars that would, has he been able to convince many scholars? Uh, no. Uh, the, the, uh, hold on a second. I'm going to try to find it real quick. So, yeah, the, the scholar you're talking about there talks about the Homeric epics and how basically Mark had these in his possession he kind of like i think the word was transvalued he took what he liked about this character and he he made it into his 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 jesus character or wherever else he was trying to do there um camille Foucault says that the hypothesis of a theological fiction composed in imitation of homer talking about the mcdonald homer epics rests on parallels that are at least venturesome and seem to be purely gratuitous so that scholar is not convinced and it doesn't seem like his work was really that convincing either because if i remember correctly in his book he doesn't have any of the uh the primary in, uh, language in there he just has the translations where he pairs them up and he says oh look at this and look at mark he must have used that as his source and really we could do that too we could probably pick out a random book and start going through the Homeric epics and try to come up with some uh, trans transvaluing. Yeah, I, I find that, uh, you know, you can find parallel details in just about anything. And I remember seeing a review um, by a classicist of uh, McDonald's book on when he tried to, with it, you know, give his hypothesis on that that he criticized. He said, you can find parallel details in anything. He said, you could find it if you look hard enough between that and Clint Eastwood's movie, Unforgiven. And, you know, just for the fun of it, uh, I, I thought about one of my favorite movies that Eastwood did, Gran Torino. It's something that my, my wife and kids and I, we, we've watched it several times. It's, it's, a, it's a funny movie about this Clint Eastwood, a guy, uh, his character is uh, Walt Kowalski, uh, a salty, Korean War veteran uh, who's a racist and um, who gets transformed uh, by the end of the movie. It's a fantastic movie and um, um, the lessons that it, it presents in there. But, you know, you can draw so many, even though Kowalski, that character, the main character is so different than Jesus, you can draw so many parallels. Like I thought about it, you, you know, you've got um, uh, Jesus had disciples. Well, uh, Kowalski had a disciple, um, a, a teenage boy that he was helping, Vietnamese boy or Cambo La Laotian boy, I think it was. And uh, Jesus fed the 5,000 and he called his, uh, the boy he was discipling fish head. Uh, so it resembles the boy who gave the fish to feed the 5,000. <laughs> and then yeah. you've got Jesus uh, says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And Walt Kowalski says, get off my lawn. And then at the end, you've got uh, Walt Kowalski, um, or Jesus, he says, I'm the light of the world. And Walt Kowalski says, I've got a light. And then you have Jesus, he gives his life for his disciples. You've got Walt Kowalski who gives his life for fish head. Um, then at the end, you have Jesus who gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to his disciples as an inheritance. And Walt Kowalski gives his grand Torino to um, his disciple. And Torino is the Italian word for Turin. For, so you got the Shroud of Turin in there. You know, so you, you've got uh, all these, these, these different parallels that you can give. But again, you can find them in just about anything. You know, sometimes in my lectures, I'll mention about, um, um, you know, most of us are aware of a plane that took off from Massachusetts early one morning. 
And just after 10 a.m., it flies into one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world between the 78th and 80th floors, killing everybody on board and sending debris to the ground. And um, so I know you think I'm referring to 9-11, but no, I'm referring to the, um, I think it was the B-24 that flew in, or the B-17 that flew into the Empire State Building on July 28th, 1945. It really happened. You can see photos of the aftermath online. So, I mean, you've got these similarities here, um, but you can find similarities in just about anything. So you've yeah. got to be able to show there's a causal connection there. I don't think McDonald uh, did that successfully. No. <laughs> wow. So uh, you mentioned a pre-market passion narrative. Do um, you want to say anything more on that? I remember Marion Swords, who was a, uh, a doctoral student supervised by uh, Raymond Brown, if I remember correctly, he did his dissertation on the pre and passion narrative. And he found that of the scholars that, that he surveyed to see what they said about it, there was hardly any agreement whatsoever on what was the Markin, pre and passion narrative. There just couldn't be any agreement on it. But what, what did you find? Did you do much research on this in your thesis? Uh, what I mainly did is I documented a little bit what was said about it and then as a source that um, Mark may have used. But yes, there there doesn't seem to be a dispute about the passion narrative, but the ones who write about it do say that there's this independent source, which basically is the last week of Jesus' life. It basically is suffering and death, that this source is independent of uh Peter, essentially. So if you, if you look at uh, church tradition, it says that Peter didn't write down an order. He just kind of wrote down these sort of antidotes. But the passion narrative is is unique in comparison to the rest of Mark because it's just one uh, straight story. It's not anything that's just put out order or anything like that. And so that means we have a uh, source that's earlier than the Gospel of Mark itself, uh, the passion narrative. Gotcha. And if Mark, of course, if Mark's getting his information, if he got his information from Peter, that's pre marking a source, right, too. Yes. But OK, so I, I can see. So what, what you're saying there. All right. Let's get down to percentages or some of the conclusions that you found regarding a Petrine connection between uh, in the Gospel of Mark between its author and Peter. What are some of your findings? Of 207 uh, scholars, how many opined on it? Well, like the authorship, I don't have the dates computed yet, or the, the, the numbers computed yet. But with uh, those who just say Peter, they don't have a secondary source with Peter. Uh, that is 51 scholars, right? And then if you add... All right, say that again, I'm sorry. The 51, what are they saying? So the 51 scholars are saying Peter. They're not saying Peter in another source. They, just, they only mention Peter. Okay. They might they might believe another source, but that's not what they wrote. Uh, and then plausibly Peter is one, possibly Peter is uh, eight. Uh, we don't we don't need pl uh, possible. We'll just go with plausible. Or okay. What about probable? Probably Peter is two. In fact, plausible. I won't even include that. We'll just say Peter is fifty one, and probable is two. All right, and then. Those who say Peter and another source, like the ones that were listed, that ends up being 38. Okay. Uh, probably Peter and other sources is four. And possibly Peter and other sources is... Now we won't is, worry about possibly. So, uh, all right, you got 42. That would be Peter plus some other sources. And you've got 53. That would be... They just mentioned Peter. Uh either Peter or probably Peter. So that's 53 and 42. You're looking at 95 out of 207. Um, uh, what, what you, did you calculate how many don't opine on it? So those who say specifically not Peter is only two. Um, those who say probably not Peter is one. Those who say Probably not Peter, but other sources 
is one, two, three, four, five, is six. Okay. And yeah, so six. You got nine total that would, would go against. <laughs> nine total yeah. that would go against and 95 in favor of a yes. Petrine connection. That's amazing. That's yeah. huge. Yeah, and the other categories wow. are something like silent or silent and other sources. So they don't outright reject Peter. They just say something else like uh, oral tradition or something like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's go silent plus silent, but other sources. How many in that category? Silent and other sources. Uh, hold on a second. That's 19. Okay. So now we're looking at 28. Still 28 versus 95. So uh, oh, there's, there's other category. There's there actually is a little bit more. There's there's not Peter, but other sources. So there is there is this other small one here. Um, How many not, in that one? So that is oh, oops, I didn't highlight it right. There's 11, and then those who say something like "not eyewitnesses," that's only four. Of course, if it's not eyewitnesses, then it can't be Peter, but. Oh wait, wait! That it's not based on the on eyewitness testimony, or that an eyewitness didn't write it. Not based on uh, eyewitness testimony. Okay, how many in that category? Uh, that was uh, one, two, three, four. Four. Is there a category probably not Peter or probably not eyewitness? Uh, there's. So I think we already did probably not Peter. That was only the one with. Oh, that's right. Yep. And they're probably not Peter, but other sources. Was six. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're looking at uh, 39, 43 then. 43 versus 95. Any other categories we missed? Uh, there's silence. Um, yeah, if they're that, silent, it doesn't, we're not looking at those. Yeah. That should be... Yeah, I think I got all of them. So... Here we go again. It's a little better than a two to one ratio in favor of Petrine connection versus not a Petrine connection. Yeah, and it's. It, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that when you look at the patristic data and all that internal data, the the, the evidence is in favor of of Peter, and the arguments against Peter are, are really just not that great. They're, they're really not. I'm not trying to be biased. They're just not. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so just to summarize as we uh, conclude this, we have looked in these three segments, we've looked at the date of composition for Mark, the arguments you know, for the various categories before 70 and after 70, and we found that um, by, let's see, is that a, was that the two to one ratio? The, uh, the uh, authorship was two to one, yeah. Authorship was two to one. Okay, so, but dating, you've got the majority of scholars, 61% of those opining um, think that Mark was written pre-70 or no later than 70. Okay, and then yep. you, so that's the majority position for the date of composition. And then for authorship, we've got a two to one ratio of scholars critical scholars writing in English since 1965, your um, sampling of 207, quite robust, two to one ratio saying that uh, the traditional authorship of Mark, John Mark is correct versus those who would say it's not correct or probably not correct. And then this third one dealing with the Petrine connection, um, again, a three to one ratio, two to one ratio, two to one ratio who say, so that Peter was either Mark's source or one of Mark's sources yes. um, for the gospel. And now, just to fine tune this a little more, when they say the second category, he was one of Mark's sources, are they thinking he was still the primary source or just one of Mark's sources? Or is it uh... I don't really think they get into that. Okay. It, they just kind of, this kind of goes through the evidence. They say, oh, you know, the, the, the church father tradition is, should be held. So Peter was Mark's source or interpreter or translator. And 
but at the end of the day, they're, they're trying to connect them with the gospel with those different words. And uh, I, I forgot the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, like when you say, you know, two to one ratio, the two here, two thirds of those opining on it, they say Peter plus other sources. Are they thinking Peter is the primary source and that others supplemented it? Or is it just a variety here? that Peter was just one of many and it's just mixed. Yeah. So it's, it probably depends on the scholar. Some, some do say like uh, something on the lines of, well, Peter probably got the bulk of his tradition from, or Mark got the bulk of the tradition from Peter, or some might say, well, it was only Peter or that uh, there's, there's gotta be these other traditions because of these various reasons. Gotcha. So, well, that's pretty cool though. Two thirds would say Mark used Peter as one of his sources, and it looks like of those, more than half of those um, would say that it was Peter, or probably Peter, without mentioning the other sources. So that's pretty cool. These, this is um, this is very interesting. I know that uh, going into this, I, I probably wouldn't have thought that that would be the case. I, I would have thought that. Um, you know, those who would say Peter wasn't involved in it would be equal to those, maybe even greater than those scholars saying that, um, that, that, uh, yeah, whatever, <laughs> that it wasn't Peter, uh, that it was Peter versus those that say it wasn't Peter. But now your research has borne out that by a two to one ratio, uh, critical scholars since 1965 are thinking that um, that Mark's source, that at least one of Mark's sources was Peter. There was a Petrine yeah. connection. And that's, that's very significant too. When we think about form criticism, which we didn't, we didn't talk a lot about, but, uh, that's been a challenge for some people who want to hold to patristics. And even in light of that higher criticism, 1965 is recent. It's still, it's still holding. No, yeah. Peter's. that's cool. So it's like what what your studies have borne out is that um, those who would say we have no idea who wrote the Gospels, uh, well, at least related to Mark's Gospel, that's no longer sustainable. Um, we do have an idea. It's not provable, but we've got some pretty good data to suggest that the traditional authorship of John Mark uh, behind Mark's Gospel is correct and that at least one of his sources was none other that than the main apostle. Peter. Yeah, and I like to also say that out of the 207 scholars I surveyed, not one of them said that Mark got his information from rising and dying God mythology. Um, that's also important because some people try to say that. Uh, and that's also at the end of the day, even if you don't think Peter wrote the gospel, if you, if you don't believe the contents, then that's what you have to deal with. You can't say you deny the contents of the gospel based upon the source, because at the end of the day, Christ still either rose or didn't rise from the grave. Yeah. So you, you can distrust what the gospels report. Uh, what I hear you saying there, you can distrust what the gospel of Mark reports, but you shouldn't use the arguments against the traditional authorship of Mark and that he got his information from Peter you probably shouldn't use those because the evidence suggests that John Mark was the author, um, that it, Peter was at least, at very minimum, one of his sources, if, if not the main source, um, and that this is the position of the majority of critical scholars today, writing in English since 1965, by a two to one ratio. Yeah. That's pretty profound, Josh. Thanks a lot, yeah. man. Um, so, the, you know, where where to now? You're thinking of doing a PhD somewhere, right? And yes. This further. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm doing studies right now at Columbia International University. So my my master's is Christian apologetics. I'm looking into biblical studies. So I have the master's degree and the thesis that they uh, they require but I don't have enough Bible study classes themselves. So right now for this year until end of summer next year, 
I'm doing the biblical languages. I just finished Greek 2. I'm on hermeneutics, and I do Greek 3 and 4, and then uh, Hebrew 1 and 2. Once I get done those, I'll start my PhD next fall, fall, fall of 2021 in biblical studies. My dissertation proposal as of right now is essentially to continue this, although uh, I think God's been laying my heart to try and look at Mark 13, try to see if there's a dating that can be established whether it be pre-factum or post-factum of the temple based on an exegesis of that. And I probably will have to do uh, Matthew 24 since that's far more uh, more information there, which the consequence of that would be, if, uh, if I'm correct right now on what I already think about it, it all three of the Synopic Gospels would be pre-70. Mm. Um, Whoa. And that, that's that's that'd be primarily a exegesis i think and I, I would probably just focus on that more than may maybe external evidence but if that's the way i go or if they deny my proposal that i have right now which is continuing this then i'll end up publishing this before i finish my dissertation because this won't be my dissertation uh right now i did start another project though it's been a little slow because interlibrary loans are slow right now with with everything that's going on so it's something similar to this where I'm, I'm serving authorship of one of the other books. And yeah, that's great, Josh. Well, yeah, we definitely need to get this uh, information from your master's thesis in an expanded version. So it's not only the dating, uh, which that was your thesis, but also this uh, other research you did on the authorship and the Petrine connection. This is important stuff. And I know this will contribute to scholarship. And thank you for the work that you've done, brother. Yeah, thank you for uh, trusting me to do it, and thank you for having me, sir. It's been great working under you and, and getting to know you. Well, thanks a lot. God bless you. And hey, just to, to mention a little plug for HBU here, uh, we've got master of degrees programs in Christian apologetics, in a master of arts in theological studies, a master in philosophy, and um, master of divinity. All that can be completed entirely on campus or entirely online fully accredited, just visit uh, the HBU's website, hbu.edu. And um, yeah, just, I, I love our faculty there. And I, I think one of the things that distinguishes HBU from many other uh, evangelical universities is, you know, we have a broad, broad evangelical tent there. So we have Protestants, we have Catholics, we have um, uh, egalitarians, complementarians, Calvinists, Arminians, Molinists, you name it. And, and we all, those who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, those who don't, and we all get along really well as the faculty. I just like that. And I, I teased my mentor, Gary Habermas, who teaches at, uh, philosophy at, and apologetics at Liberty, and, and my friend Sean McDowell and, and Craig Hazen over at uh, Biola. And I'll say at, you know, at Biola and Liberty, they will teach you what to think. But at HBU, we teach you how to think. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, you know, we present the views, but, um, you know, we don't require students to 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 embrace those views. And, and we try to present a, a, the broader views as, as well. And they can take whatever position. We don't penalize them for it. We want them to think on their own. So, all right. And you found that to be the case there during your your studies, your program? Yes, I think that uh, online school for me for a while was a drag, I thought. But the way that the apologetics program at HBU is set out, I think, is, is very good because the, the school puts you on your own and you're sitting there reading through some very complex books like the, the Blackwell Companion for Natural Theology. That was horrible to read. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that's the point is, is that – you read these tough books, you have to analyze it and you have to write. And as a student, that's what I want to learn how to do. And as it relates to taking exams, I don't like taking exams on online format because I feel like people cheat. Whereas if you have to write an essay, I feel like now the integrity, I'm not saying Christian studies students would do that, but you never know. Uh, I feel like writing essays and doing the things that uh, scholars and, and, and formal apologists do is, is, is good for it's good. It's good training for the field, basically. Oh, good. Well, it's a pleasure having you as a student, Josh. And uh, thanks for uh, uh, talking about your research. God bless you, brother.
Thank you. Have a good one.